Okay, guys, I think without further ado, I should start. Um, so I would continue with this uh, lecture five and we last time stopped at diffraction. Um, so Right, there is a certain, just a second. Okay, just trying to put it somewhere. I don't know how to make it disappear, this thing. Okay. So, okay, so he, he, here, um, I think we discussed about the geometry of diffraction pattern uh, last time, and uh, we discussed this thing, that how are the diffraction pattern formed? And when we were forming the diffraction pattern, I uh, told you that I would uh, tell you about the diffraction pattern formed by monocrystal, polycrystal, amorphous, um, and uh, other, other type of diffraction pattern from which you can actually take out the information about, um, about your uh, crystal. Now, this is uh, something that we would be using again and again in today's lecture. So I would just uh, give you a quick summary. And I think I presented it last time. So here uh, we have a transmitted beam and this transmitted beam is going through definitely your crystal, which has got your HKL uh, reflecting planes. And I would talk about Miller indices and HKL reflecting, uh, reflecting planes a little bit. But uh, the important thing here is that you have an incident beam that is giving you the transmitted spot. This incident beam is passing through your uh, sample with the lattice spacing D and it is giving you a diffracted spot. Now. If your sample is a crystal, in that case, you clearly see two spots. One is transmitted and other is diffracted. And last time I showed you uh, a diffraction pattern. Now, because it has a proper uh, D spacing going on within the sample, so you see this transmitted spot and you see this uh, diffracted spot. What if there is no spacing like that? what happens then? So here, uh, if uh, the spacing would change as uh, your uh, inside plane configuration changes. So overall, we would talk about four or five kind of diffraction patterns that are commonly observed under electron microscope. So uh, one, we will see a spot. Um, then we would see a ring then we would see the development of the amorphous zone, which would be in the form of a diffuse ring. Then I would talk about a convergent beam, um, electron diffraction. Then we would talk about Kikuchi lines, and we would talk about holes, which is high order Lovey zone. This one is more uh, something that is uh, related to the reciprocal lattice. And we would uh, talk in detail once we talk about reciprocal lattice. Now, very important here. What kind of information can we uh, can we take from the diffraction pattern? From a diffraction pattern, we can measure the average spacing between the layers or the row of atoms. That is the value of D. We can determine the orientation of a single crystal or a grain. So um, I think we talked about it. I would introduce today something called zone axis. And then we can find the crystal structure of an unknown material. That means if I um, 
take a sample and make a thin specimen out of it, I would, uh, with the crystal structure, if it is FCC, BCC, and also between the diffraction pattern spacing, I can really guess what is the sample. And then uh, this is a little bit advanced, but we can measure the size, shape, and internal stress of small crystalline regions. So with electron microscopy, you can measure the stress um, for a small regions. Uh, for example, if you have a little precipitate or little inclusion in the sample, and you are seeing some kind of uh, changes in the pattern, um, with that, is it, it is possible to apply some basic formulas and try to find out what are the internal stresses on the sample. Now, this is here. Uh, we are here. So I think we talked about it, but this is again very important for today. So we recall uh, uh, this from our previous classes where we talk about selected area diffraction pattern formation. Uh, this is a, a recall. You, when you get a diffraction pattern of a certain magnification on your sample, uh, you can play with the diffraction pattern. And it is an important step because it helps in measuring different, uh, different, uh, different quantities you can measure through it by playing with a diffraction pattern. Now on screen, you see that we have a sample here and you have uh, simply the electron beam and this electron beam mostly is transmitted and it forms a kind of a, a coffer spot here. And now, uh, with the diffraction beam, uh, you also have a diffracted beam, as you know. And if um, here is the objective lens and here you will press a button D and it will produce a diffraction pattern. Now with the choice of intermediate lens, you can literally magnify that pattern. And once you magnify it, you can literally uh, take out various uh, information that I discussed on the previous slide. Now here you see that uh, for example, uh, what is the kind of calibration you would do? So uh, the kind of calibration that you would do is basically uh, everything, the magnification that you would find here by playing with the current of the objective lens. So that is the one parameter that you would see. So with, uh, with your uh, person who is taking your lab, you have to just ask them with which respect to the objective lens current, there would be a particular magnification of the diffraction pattern. And as you increase the current, definitely your back focal plane would change and also your magnification of the diffraction pattern. So you're looking here for a calibration value. So this thing uh, is uh, what is um, we are trying to say here that we need to adjust exact intermediate lens focus or current. And once we are able to do that, we should know, we should, we would be able to know what is the magnification of a diffraction pattern because that magnification of the diffraction pattern is actually giving us all the information. Now I am trying to get rid of this. So I have to Google it that how to get rid of this. This is slightly. This is not expected. Anyways, anyone knows how to get rid of are it? You, are you talking about like the um, the banner that kind of has all the stuff on yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I there's like a there's an arrow somewhere. I think it's on like the far right side, maybe. That if you click on it, it should say something like hide meeting controls or something, and it should be able to go away. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So uh, here, that's what is happening. So we have a selected area pattern formation. Um, and this is the main uh, message from this slide is that your diffraction pattern magnification, it depends on objective lens current. That is here. 
and you should know exactly the calibration. If you don't know uh, for what uh, current of the objective lens, what is the magnification, magnification of the diffraction pattern, then you will have struggle with the values that you would get for your D. So in practice, we should be doing this activity. I would take some iron chromium samples and would ask you to measure the distance between the points. And you would see that difference between the points would change as you change the magnification. And uh, thus to have the right value of calibration here is, is of utmost importance. Now, Here is again the recall because I would be talking in detail about how the diffraction patterns are formed, would be introducing you the concept of zone axis. So we recall this, right? Uh, so these are your planes here, and this is your uh, transmitted light, uh, which is your transmitted electrons here. And you know that uh, this would be the most brightest spot in your diffraction pattern because most of the light is passing through it. Now, the spots which are on the sides, they definitely uh, contains the information about, uh, about D. Now, if you see here very carefully that this is the transmitted uh, light and this is a diffracted light, and it has an angle of theta here. And if I make and join this point, this will have again some angle associated to it. And it would, it would give the information of 2G. So with a very simple uh, vector, ad vector addition, you can find it out that here, your, this is your resultant value of the vector, which is basically the addition of Ki and G. And if I draw a line here, it would be the same thing. With the addition of two G values plus Ki, it would give you a new vector, which is a Kd. And by, by knowing this, uh, you can literally calculate all your uh, D values. Now, in, in many cases, if you will have a sample and you will have a precipitate associated to it. So there are a lot of cases that uh, you will get two diffraction pattern, which would be slightly superimposing on each other. And this kind of condition could occur from a uh, from lot of places, such as you know, where you have your sample your FIB sample and it, it became slightly oxygenated. Very easily happens in your uh, reactor pressure visual steel, which is your iron chromium, uh, because it is, um, despite it has chromium, but uh, it gets very easily oxidized. So every time you use it um, in the microscope, what you do is you try to get rid of uh, the, the pattern and the oxygen layer and you would get rid of the pattern. So what I'm talking about is if you have, for example, a diffraction pattern, which is like this, then you will also have another diffraction pattern, which would be slightly superimposing, maybe like, you know, like this. And both these diffraction patterns, they are coming from the same area. Yeah. So both these diffraction patterns are coming from the same area. So in reality, what you are having is you have your transmitted beam, you have your sample, and where you have, um, and it goes to an objective lens here, and you get something called a diffracted beam D. And you have a transmitted beam T here, right? And what you get is a, a pattern like this, simply. Now, in this case, what happens is you will also have a certain oxidation on the top. And which is giving you this pattern from the oxidation is giving you a pattern, which is where I marked it with the, with the crosses, whereas there would be a pattern which would be coming directly from this uh, main sample, which is marked in the form of a circle. So my point is your microscope which has a very high resolution, it is able to pass your electron light through whatever comes on its way. So you can have multiple diffraction pattern and you will have to uh, separate them 
by either tilting or by going to the edges where you have uh, less uh, oxidation present and then comparing it. And then you can definitely play with the spot intensity and you can, when, um, so you will go with the uh, Gitan microscopy software playing with the intensity and you can literally eliminate these spots and try to measure uh, the D corresponding to the main plane versus you can also measure if it is oxidation or maybe some other impurity on the sample, which you can measure it. Any questions anyone has here? Okay. So now talking about uh, this thing now, uh, we are here um, and we are trying to understand how is the diffraction pattern for single uh, crystal material looks like. So does anyone has uh, any question about these spots and why do they have different names? Anyone, uh, you understand what are these values here? Can anyone explain to me? Yeah, so each uh, spot corresponds to a family of lattice planes. And in uh, moving from spot to spot in reciprocal space is analogous to moving to uh, different real space T spacings, or, uh, well, specifically families of planes, not just T spacings. Right. So then, uh, if so, what uh, Ryan is uh, telling us is that each spot represents a family of planes. Now here, uh, what is, so this thing, something is, should be actually, it's coming from uh, basic crystallography and normally uh, it should be uh, obvious, but if you want, I can give you a brief introduction some other day about how to, you know, index them. So most of you have done Miller indices and everything. So it is directly coming from there. And uh, so if, if you want, I can give you a very small exercise how to, uh, you know, about the nomenclature of these crystal planes. Because once you see it, so here, um, this is a positive side, two bar. And other, if, if you remove the two and it becomes two zero zero, it would be a positive, a positive, positive G. So plus G and minus G. So uh, it's something similar to here, plus G minus G is actually this thing here. So if this is my plane zone axis and I give it a position, a zero position to it, uh, but in generally it will have a kind of, uh, it will have its, um, have its uh, nomenclature there and you will have G and minus G. Now this G and minus G is actually positive plane and the negative plane of the same thing. So I am making here G with the same thing. I can also make making negative G. So which is a single plane is giving me two kind of, uh, two kind of orientations plus G and minus G. And it is the same thing here. It is here if you see minus two G and two G, which would be, it looks to you that it, it would come from this plane. However, it's not coming from this plane. This one, one G here, this is your transmitted beam. And I will draw here and it would give you minus G into this direction, diffraction. And this thing is coming from, again, plus two G and minus two G, they're coming from the same, same plane, but in the different directions. So it is giving you these values. And here there is a, if I, uh, if I, uh, you know, draw another point, you will have two zero zero, and then you will also have uh, minus two zero zero on the other side. 
So I do not have an example of the complete diffraction pattern where they are mentioning it, but each, each plane has its negative G as well as its positive G. So this is basically uh, your diffraction pattern now, which consists of uh, all the planes. And if I go and look at the overall, uh, overall diffraction pattern, you will see both minus G and plus G there. So this is very important. Now, what happens is, so first of all, you have to find, when you have a diffraction pattern, you have to find the building block of the diffraction pattern. Now here, the building block of this diffraction pattern is you see that it has got two distances into it. If this is a center spot, in some of the spots, uh, in some of the diffraction patterns, you would see that the distance that is G2 here and G1, they are the same, depending on the crystal. And then it would be a proper beautiful triangle here. And here it is a triangle where the sides are not equal. Now, the main uh, thing is you have to know what are the key distances here in any diffraction spot. And you can try to predict the position of the third spot based on these two. So here, if this is a third spot here, so basically it is a kind of a parallelogram here. And in this parallelogram, you are doing nothing. You know that this one and this one is also G1 and this one is also G2. So you can predict this position by simply adding G1 and G2. And in this way, you can actually, on your paper, you should be able to draw a spot spot pattern and you should be able to complete this diffraction pattern. So this is a, a very important information. So the people who are doing the project on the dislocation loops, they would be doing a lot of these things and I would be helping, helping them uh, with the G.B analysis. Uh, so can you remind me who, who are doing from the group uh, this thing, um, uh, G.B analysis and uh, is, who is doing Mervyn, Sydney, that you are doing eels? Um, yeah, we're doing eels. Yeah, Rayan and Jonathan, you are doing uh, precipitates, is that right? Correct. So who is doing uh, dislocations? Uh, me and Jacob. Uh, who is that? Sorry. Thomas, me, me and Jacob are, are doing dislocations. Okay, right, Thomas and, uh, right. So you guys have to, uh, you know, with you, uh, we are going to take an example. And I think this could be really a paper in itself. Uh, if you dig deep and it could be very important for your learning to how to do this G.B analysis. Um, and uh, uh, we all have to now, so the idea of this thing is that I want uh, to have uh, a strong participation from all of you in this key topics because all of these key topics is one of the research paper. And uh, you have to really interact with me. At least I talked about one session you can also have uh, because this is a difficult topic. So you can have multiple sessions with me where I would sit with you and you know we open this book and we try to understand the Kikuchi lines and the diffraction spot. Take one case. Uh, take one paper and we talk about how to accurately do G.B analysis. And then we, uh, we talk about that particular case, which has come from a research paper um, and discuss it in front of the class. So despite your turn, uh, so next, uh, next uh, Friday, I'm expecting Julie and Tommy to uh, present in front of the class about the bubbles, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think Monday or um, some, uh, you know, whenever you want, we can discuss it. It should be uh, some research cases there. And then um, Thomas and one of the people like Ryan or Jonathan from each group, you can, uh, or both of you together, we can start building a case, case by case. And uh, this, uh, Maybe one meeting is required or multiple, but uh, the precipitated analysis and the dislocation G.B analysis, I don't expect that one meeting would be enough if we want to do a quality work, right? 
so my point is um, be in touch and start building your projects so here this is we will talk about g.b analysis uh, in the project of thomas uh, and we will tell you that how these uh, values of g so in reality you get this diffraction spot and these diffraction spot now you will have two brighter spot on your screen and then you would tilt your sample and a beam in a way that you get only uh, the image information from 1G. And then you will tilt another spot. And it's all about tilting. Once you get these spots, you bring your, uh, your condition in a way that you get information now from this plane, or from this, uh, this G. And once you have, so what, what I'm trying to do is here, why this is very important for me is, for example, if this is my crystal here, and I have got different dislocation loops here, this is my crystal here. So what I'm trying to do is, and I have got a loop here in the center. Now, what would be, uh, say this is uh, somewhere is my zone axis. So zone axis is basically, I would talk uh, in the mathematical term in the following slide, but here uh, I have my zone axis where, you know, this is my zone axis, for example, or maybe, you know, and when I see, I see my crystal into, into this, uh, this direction. Now, what I'm trying to do ideal is I'm trying to tilt my sample. So this is your condition here, X, and this is your Y, and this is your Z, for example. And you are trying to tilt your sample, which is containing the dislocation loop along these directions. So in, in, in one way, if you are trying the same crystal, you can look into this direction the same crystal, you would look into this direction. And basically these directions are these family of planes. So you are just trying to look at the same dislocation loop in different directions along the different family of planes. So what happens is if anyone looks at from this direction, which is your top view here, you know what you would see? You would see an open loop like this. Uh, this is your plane and if you show me an image you would show me an image like this whereas a person other person he tries not to look like this like an open plane but only looks from the top so for him the the, the dislocation loop will only look like a small line like this because he is looking from here so then the, the the bottom part of it is hidden under it so basically it is like this but he is not seeing this part. It's simply the question of perspective. So what happens is you, you try to have information along 1G, which gives you an open loop. In other condition, you will find an edge loop. And if you remember in the previous, um, so I should also, uh, I should also be uh, showing you this thing here. So this was in the lecture four. Here, if you remember, I had this slide here. Uh, you see uh, this new share, is it visible, guys? Is this visible? Yeah, slide says diffraction pattern. With, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, cool. So if you see here, so in this one, so in this one family here, you see some of the loops, they are like the one which is highlighted already. Okay, this is, has gone there. Why?
Do you guys see the team image? No. Something happened. Yeah, it's the same diffraction pattern slide. Okay. Now what I'm trying to share is something. Yep, here. If I come here, it just changes. Okay. It should do it. Screen share. Keep. Okay, just a second. It would be easy. So here in this one, on the image, here, do you see my pointer, guys? That's what I'm trying to actually play with. Um, if I don't, if you don't see my pointer, it would be tough for you to just figure out where I'm pointing. We see the uh, mouse, it's just a mouse icon. Okay, but you see something, right? That's yep. cool. So here, it is very important. Uh, so this is the image that people have taken, um, you know, uh, at the zone axis or at a particular G. So this thing you have to find out once. Uh, so it is taken from a zone axis like this, but at a particular G. So here we have taken a zone axis 0, 0, 001. So what happens is you go and you press D. And once you press D, you should be seeing a zone axis. Now, if you are not seeing the zone axis, you would, uh, you would uh, see some spots. And slowly you would uh, move your sample to a place that you should be coming at a zone axis. Now here, you see here on the zone axis, what you see is you see different uh, loops here. Now at the same image, one of the loops that you see are these coffee beans kind of, uh, uh, beans kind of a loop. Other loop that you see is a big oval loop. Now, both of the loops, you know, are the same kind of loop, but in different G's. So this thing, if I tilt, it would, it would become like this. You're opening up the loop, but this one is not fully open. This is one that is, is the loop that you will see that it is a loop which is present on zero to zero. It is, it is the loop which is present on this plane as a, in the same way as I explained to you uh, in the slide that you are directly looking from the top. But these loops, which are also present, these, these are the loops you are not looking from the top. These are the loops you are, you are either looking at a sideway, little tilted way. And if you want to know uh, the, the information about these loops, that which planes contain these loops, there you have to do this G dot B analysis. So uh, this thing uh, is something uh, that I wanted to highlight. Whatever you are seeing in a microscope in one G from other G, the shape and size, it would totally change. It's slightly difficult to, uh, to see and observe with your eyes uh, at the first instance, but then things become gradually clear. So now this is what, is happening here in this one. So this is this was your uh, crystal, and the the loop that I showed you, an open loop, is exactly you are looking in the same direction. And once uh, you would uh, get into microscopy you would see that a zone axis is basically the direction of your eye. So it is that direction from your eye is looking, it is the same direction your zone axis is present. 
And once you have the, the photo of your zone axis or your diffraction pattern of your zone axis, it would simply tell you, so this is here, if this is your zone axis and these are your different planes and each family of plane is here. So it will give you the complete representation of uh, G's along the zone axis. Do, does anyone have question here? I would be happy to answer because I know this is this is slightly uh, slightly complicated, but not very complicated if uh, taught in the right manner. Okay. So now I would introduce you something called uh, something called zone axis. Okay. So you see here, this is the this is the zone axis that we got, and in this zone axis, this is the this is the most brightest spot because this is the transmitted spot. And what you see here, you see here that. So now this is a diffraction pattern, and you see one thing here. Here is a plus G spot. That is two bar zero zero. And here is a two zero zero spot. Plus G and minus G spot. So if you go in the same uh, same line, you will be able to get plus G and minus G. Now here, this is one one zero. This is a plus G spot. And then this is one bar one bar zero. This is minus G spot. So from the central position, if you try to uh, just start naming these points, and once you start naming them, you would see that there will be a very clear trend of plus G and minus G. Otherwise, you won't be able to understand your crystal. And this is what, there are a lot of uh, analysis that you do to make sure that something you see well, you, you take the image of that particular feature in plus G and you take that information in minus G as well. Now, if you just carefully look at this pattern, everywhere there is a plus G and minus G for each of the spot. So here, this is your, and this is your spot where you have I think you will have two different distances. So this one distance here is slightly bigger than that. So this is a this is a pattern like this. Do not look at the cross here, only look at these solid points here. And these are the example of the BCC zone axis. Now this is a zone axis which is zero zero one. And in in literature, your zone axes are very, very clear. Which one of them is 001? So the 001 zone axis actually look like this. So you have to just join points around this central point. Do not join it across any other point because then it would give you a different shape. So join it across the central point to see what is the shape like. So here I see a very clear shape. It's like, you know, uh, there's a kind of, how to say, a rectangle is present. So what I'm trying to say here, I would join it for you so that it's easy. So this is the zone axis here. And this is where the entire microscopy, the basis of the entire microscopy lies. So this is a kind of a, if a pattern and you should be very clear that in BCC, uh, which would be your iron, um, iron, some iron alloys and basically iron and your pure BCC metals, they will present a zone axis like this and which will be a zero zero one. And now for zero one one zone axis, how, how does it look like for zero one one one, for zero one one, for zero one one, it simply looks like a central point here. And you see that from the central point, we got two distances. One is your distance L here, 
and there is this distance here, uh, L here. So the uh, one is your M. So by this, you would know the values of different uh, vectors that would help you create the entire diffraction spot for different analysis. And you would be doing that. So how does the shape of 0, 1, 1 zone axis for BCC looks like? Guys, this is where everything in microscopy lies. It looks like this. And this pattern would be repeated. Now, in this one, again, I would emphasize here, what are the spots we got? We got some spots here, plus G and minus G. 2, 0, 0, minus 2 bar, 0, 0. 2 bar, if you look carefully at this point, 2 bar, 1, 1 bar, the opposite side becomes 2, 1 bar, 1. And here it is 2 bar, 1 bar, 1. And here it becomes 2, 1, 1 bar. So even uh, like a lot of microscopists, once they do BCC, you know, it's, it's already registered in their mind uh, about the different zone axes and their shapes. Now, other famous zone axes in BCC, 1 bar 1. So basically what is happening? And this is another, another uh, 1 bar 1, 2. And the pattern look like this. Now, now you can imagine, right? Now it, it should become very clear, right? You can do this thing on all of it. Now, what is a zone axis? Let us try, let us quickly try to understand what is a zone axis here. So a zone axis. Now where is my just a second? This. Uh -huh. Hold on. Right, so in the zone axis, what we see here, your zone axis is UVW. This is your zone axis, that is a UVW. It is a direction which is common to all planes of the zone. So this zone axis is basically perpendicular to the normal of this plane. So this is your HKL plane. And you can simply know the coordinates of HKL by Miller indices. And I should tell you that uh, by Miller indices, H is generally equals to one by A, K is generally equal to one by Y, and L is quickly equal to one by Z. And this is where you are getting these coordinates. Now, for, for the zone axis, we simply see if UVW is a vector that is contained in the plane. The plane in which it is contained, the normal to that plane would be perpendicular to this zone axis. So here, this is the zone axis. Uh, this is the zone axis and this is the perpendicular to it. And if you take any planes, so uh, basically a zone axis is a vector to which all the planes perpendicular to that vector or all the planes are basically perpendicular to it. And then if you multiply them, you simply get, because they would be uh, this uh, H and U. So H and U here, H, K, L, actually it's, uh, it should be very easy. So first of all, I would like, uh, one thing to know, I don't know how much you're able to uh, relate to it. If this is a plane, how do you define this plane? A plane is defined by the direction of its normal. So this is, this is basically uh, different people say different things, but this is a, a perpendicular line to the plane defines the plane. So if I am telling that they, uh, the zone axis is basically perpendicular to the plane. It simply means that this is, this is here is the vector that defines this plane. 
and zone axis is perpendicular to this 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 plane and this is called the zone axis any questions here i don't know how much you guys got it this is your plane here how do i define this plane this plane is h k l and this is the this is my plane which is defined by this normal here and what would be my zone axis here my zone axis would be so i'm trying to just emphasize a lot on this because you would be mad here in this term again and again a zone axis would be an axis which is perpendicular to this plane that's it this is your zone axis here which is your uvw here in terms of vector notation and you should be knowing about this like super clear this is u v and w and if you just try to multiply them and add them in the coordinates this will give you uh this uh, hu plus kv plus lw would give you zero so this your zone axis is perpendicular to all at all the planes and this is given by v uh, v zone law so this one is actually what you see why you see this zone axis here do you uh, understand why is it is a zone axis now this is a zone axis because there is a plane which is just passing through my computer screen perpendicular and all these family of planes so this there would be a there would be a line which would be passing that would be essentially perpendicular to all these planes this is a family of planes this this perpendicular would be here so that is why this is my zone axis and i would say this is my zone axis the center point and when it is a zone axis all my planes are lying perpendicular to it so this is how uh, a very simple representation is this now this was something that you would be this is like the basis for your microscopy this is what you would see and this is what you would play with and most of the study is about indexing single crystal patterns now going to the polycrystalline material what is happening in the polycrystalline material in the polycrystalline material what is there are multiple crystals and there are multiple diffraction patterns are happening now when there are multiple diffraction patterns you are obtaining then what do you get you basically get the superimposition of all these points which gives you this kind of a circle so these kind of refraction patterns they are coming from a polycrystal now in the polycrystal as well it is highly likely that you should be able to tell that this is what kind of polycrystal how would you do that in the previous uh, single crystal you simply measure the d that was the d between the two points in this one what you do is because there are multiple diffraction pattern happening so this thing you would see that all the spots are very near to each other so basically what is happening is there are so many diffraction pattern that is happening at a particular d so at this particular d so for example here you see that we had two distances l and m so here also there are two distances l and m so at one particular distance you would see that there is one pattern happened because all the diffraction which is at that distance they are happening at a very greater intensity so they are present all in all directions and also it's a polycrystal so you cannot say that 
that this is uh, this is coming from particular family of planes it is coming from a particular family of planes but because of polycrystals there are so many uh, family of planes which are aligned in 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 one uh, in in that particular direction so what are, what is happening here is so if you join this only the point that are corresponds to m so this one i will just join so this point here is giving me a first d and this one then the second point here the second circle here which would be the diffraction that is coming from the second point and giving me all d so you see that i created two circles here and why was there was a need of creating this circles you get these points if it was a single crystal but in the polycrystal these points are also connected because these points which are at the same distance they are coming from all the other polycrystal line planes so that is why we get a feature like this we have 100 then it becomes 110 then it becomes 2000 and then it becomes 210 so there could be an exercise which is very much in your uh, in your uh, tem where you should be able to convert the pattern of polycrystal to single crystal and in large part you can do that you have to be very careful but you have to literally you know there are ways where you will see some of the spots and if you change this diffraction pattern you will see some of the spots are very little bit brighter than the other because the diffraction is happening a little bit higher from there and you would know the position and from that you would be able to you know know the position of uh, 110 some uh, spots which are maybe a little bit higher intensity and you can literally deconstruct this entire rings into the single crystal any questions here very very important for your learning these two slides i'm open for discussion anything guys no questions i want to try to uh, just so for a, to collect a pattern like this what is a typical uh like a real space area that you're looking at ah uh, so if it is a proper pure crystal right like if it's a your entire sample is a pure crystal the moment you press d it would show you the rings like that like instantly because polycrystals are amorphous regions they are most easy uh crystals to work with because so much diffraction is happening that you would not worry about anything whatever every time you see you see these spots clear so you just go so i think uh, we should be doing this activity and where you know you would clearly see this crystal as soon as you put the sample into it but in other cases this would be most tricky and this one what you would see is a pattern which would be you know like this and once you see a pattern like this you would say why i am not seeing a very good pattern but in another cases you will clearly see clear rings so just for everyone uh, it's very commonly we see this kind of diffraction pattern and people can interpret very different information from it here you are seeing this spots here right and you you are also seeing some kind of rings which are following from polycrystals because you are in the condition where your diffraction pattern is not clear so you will have to go to a condition so a lot of people uh, when you show them this diffraction pattern they would say you are very near to the zone axis so you will literally have to move your sample so that you become immediately under zone axis and here is the condition where i was telling you if anyone who do burger vector analysis and he goes on plus g and minus g i would simply uh, ask you to keep on 
you know, uh, having a tandem uh, shift between your D and your image. So if this is your, uh, this is your uh, line or the transmitted beam, which is coming here, sometimes you will just move it on this part versus you will move it on this part and you will take the information just by little, little change. So again, anyone shows you this kind of diffraction pattern, you're very close to the zone axis. So zone axis is just here on the right. You just have to go. And these lines are basically the roadmaps of your crystal. And these lines, as I told you last time, Kikuchi diffraction pattern is basically forming from the inelastic scattering of the planes. So these lines are actually the planes. These dots are coming from a concentrated family of planes. This is a plane. This represents the family of planes. And from these uh, planes, it acts as the map or a road to reach to these points. So this is what you would be seeing in most of the cases. Uh, any other question? This is, this is where your microscopy uh, lies. And I, I would not hesitate to go back through these slides again and again and trying to talk about each spot, trying to talk about how we measure different Ds. Even personally and even you know, in any projects, I would talk about this thing again and again till the time you're bored out of it. Seriously. Now, we are able to convert a polycrystalline uh, uh, diffraction pattern from a single crystal pattern. And now what do we see in the next one? What happens? What happens when you see such kind of texture in the ring patterns? What does that mean? Now you can, uh, you know, uh, you already went from a single crystal pattern to a polycrystal pattern. Now, what do I understand if I see a pattern like this? Now it's written already as a title. So any explanations, guys, I would love to hear. So I mean, like, in terms of like grain texture, so like it's cold work or something, they have elongation in a certain direction. Yes. So what, this was a good point, Thoma. So uh, Thomas, uh, so what uh, happens here is, You see that some of the rings or some of the areas of the ring, which I told you that they actually are points in the single patterns, which are more illuminated than another one. That means even if it's a polycrystal, but majority of the grains in that polycrystal, they are oriented in one particular direction. So it would say that distribution of orientation is not purely random, but it is preferred. For example, it's a polycrystal. Then I would say, hey, some of the crystals are oriented in one, one direction, some of them in one, one, zero direction, but most of them are oriented in one, one direction, right? So this is uh, where we talk about a texture in ring patterns. Very common observation in many of your nuclear materials. Now, this is another diffraction pattern that very commonly observed. What do we see here is an amorphous diffraction pattern. Why do we see this blob of light? We see this blob of light because everything is getting diffracted in all directions. There is no order at all. Polycrystals, we still have an order, right? In amorphous, there is no immediate order. There could be long range uh, order present though. So that's why we see this clear light that majority of the light uh, is present like this and there is no exact pattern. So here on slide it says, amorphous materials do not have random placement of atoms. Instead distance between neighbors follows a probability function a radial distribution function, which can be recorded and measured. So I have, uh, a, we 
worked a lot during covid but that work uh, unfortunately it didn't uh, get complete because i was uh, involved with other projects and i was working on some kind of intermetallics where i was trying to measure the amount of amorphization happening in these samples by these diffraction patterns and you can do that there is a clear math uh, uh, mathematical formula which are available and you can simply know your value of order and disorder and you can predict uh, so normally zero is uh, is when your material is fully uh, fully i think the disorder is zero and when it has one you will say it has a disorder of one and from fully disorder to zero uh, disorder it goes from zero to one and you can take this value out anyone who has interest i i can you know uh, show you uh, those images right now we talked about kikuchi now kikuchi is the thing that you would be seeing every day because most of the time you would be not be at the zone axis so what is happening here first most important question kikuchi in elastic in elastic diffraction is happening not the elastic diffraction now this is your incident beam this is your reflecting plane so i should talk about this thing because this is important to me a lot so this is your incident beam here this is your plane here right that you see and what is happening at the bottom of this plane you see these lines what is happening in this lines so this plane is a not a line right a plane has certain thickness right associated to it this plane has certain thickness associated to it and this is represents this thickness is represented like this this is the hkl so you see here very similar to your plus g and minus g same kind of a thing so you see here h bar k bar l bar here you see is hkl and this is your inelastic scattering that means you have losses involved and what you see here at the bottom that your center is simply seen in the in the center of the lines and then there is a width of these kikuchi lines and this width actually represents your planes now we talk about edwell sphere here and edwell sphere here and so this edwell sphere is basically nothing when you have a different diffraction spot so i can quickly draw it for you can i just yeah. ask a question real quick yeah so if i'm looking at this right the the kikuchi lines are basically like sections through that cone so they're not i mean i guess they show up as straight lines because you're looking at kind of a small slice of it but mm -hmm. in reality they're uh, it's a projection okay. that you're looking it's a projection okay. that you're looking yeah got it thank you yeah yeah it's a projection uh, exactly uh, and uh, here i want to say that this coastal cone so this is uh, nothing but a plane here and this plane has um, when you call it uh, it's in a very broad way you can call it you know it's a it's a thickness or it's a kind of a little uh, kind of a geometrical figure which they have represented it by cone which represents the plane hkl value and this thing is basically is tries to insert with your edwell sphere here and when it inserts the edwell sphere it gives to the kikuchi line now what is edwell sphere actually edwell sphere is nothing but it's a kind of a sphere 
where it contains all the diffraction spots. For practical purposes, when you see on the microscope, you don't need to know this. You only need to see that, you only need to know that you are seeing a Kikuchi line. A Kikuchi line is what? It is actually your plane. Center of the Kikuchi line is your plane. That's what you have to remember. And it is coming by the intersection, intersection of these Edward sphere with your these cones, which is like here. So this is one projection is intersection in, is, is getting uh, an intersection from other Edward sphere and you form a Kikuchi line here. Now in this one, it's the same thing here. Oh my God, this gets slightly tough for me to operate, but anyways. So now if you see here, okay, this was easy. So now here, if you see that you have a plane and these are your scattered electrons. So here at the center, it is forming you the projection of uh, HKL plane. Here is the projection of HKL plane, exactly this. And here is your cone, which represents you plus G and minus G. This is your excess line. This is your deficient line in a diffraction pattern. So basically they are nothing. They are basically your, uh, if you see here very carefully, so this is your, uh, these are your, both the things are your diffracted electrons. And one of them is favoring, one of them is more brighter than the other. Because one of the direction uh, is directly in, in alignment with your transmitted beam. And when you see them, you see them like this. Everything what you see here uh, is plus G minus G. And you see here one light is more brighter than the other. Always. And so if we carefully observe them, uh, now if we try to carefully read about them uh, into this one here, so the Kikuchi lines pass straight through the transmitted and diffracted spot. The diffracting planes are therefore tilted at exactly the Bragg angle to the optic axis. So here, where is the transmitted spot and where is the diffracted spot? So now in this one, this is my transmitted spot and these are my diffracted spot. And my Kikuchi lines, they are passing straight through them to my transmitted and diffracted spot. And here we have slightly tilted them. It's very tough for you guys right now to understand what I'm talking about. Now the crystal has now been slightly tilted away from Bragg's angle. So the QQG line no longer passed to the transmitted and the diffracted spot. What did you see here? Very clearly, if you just carefully pay attention here, transmitted and diffracted spot, you can literally tilt your crystal in a way that there is a line that is passing here. In this one, the, you have tilted your Kikuchi line into this here. So that some of them, it is passing to a diffracted spot, but nothing is passing through the transmitted spot. And in this one, here the crystal is tilted so that more than one set of planes are diffracting. Yes, it is. Each set of planes has its own Kikuchi lines. So in this one, one of the lines is here, one of the lines is here, one of the lines is here. And one of the line is also here. And here I see a superimposition. Any questions? This is a, what I'm trying to say through this, 
that how in different crystals uh, you can see the formation of Hikuchi diffraction lines and you can simply play with your tilt angle and you can just move this position of beam to, to here. Sorry about that. Any questions, guys? Yeah, I have a question, Shraddha. So in that first picture, um, mm. so the caption passes straight through the transmitted and diffracted spots. Uh, to my layman's eyes, I, I see spots on there that have no lines passing through them. Do you just have to be conscious of like what, what, what specific? Uh, so you know what? This is a very important question. You, you always do not see Kikuchi diffraction lines. Why don't you see that? Now, it all depends on your sample thickness. So your sample should be slightly thick to have multiple diffractions going on. And if your multiple diffraction would go on, then only you see them. So for a sample, which is really nicely made, you would not see them. So for dislocation loop characterization, it's a very common saying, please keep your sample a little bit thick. because this is an additional diffraction going on and you take an advantage of this diffraction, right? The generally, you do not need this kind of diffraction pattern. Like you literally need this, this is an ideal condition and you obtain these ideal conditions in, uh, in, in most of the cases when the sample is good. But what we want right now is, uh, is a pattern like this because this is very important for me to characterize uh, my sample at different Gs. I just don't do anything. I simply take my Kikuchi lines at different Gs and take, take the values out. Did I answer you, Ryan? Did I answer you? Scarlett, yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah okay. So my, my main point here was that you do not see it always. So I'm coming on the next slides and we'll talk about it. We are left with 15 minutes, uh, but this is very, very important, these few slides I discussed with you, because practically you would be seeing that. Uh, I would be talking about now multiple diffractions and thickness is required for different kind of uh, experiments that you do on microscope. Now, uh, 15 minutes, I think I would talk about sample preparation, which is other than FIB. And uh, now we, the class um, content would become very easy, very easy to understand. Uh, we already talked about focused ion beam. Um, and we know that focused ion beam is one of the methods uh, which is very commonly used these days. But a lot of people from our group we are doing electropolishing. If you heard about uh, last time, I think in the, uh, in the group meeting, we were talking about tripods. And then we talk about iron mill. And these are different uh, methods by which you can make your sample electron transparent and in your career, you will have to use all of them at certain point, depending upon the sample that you're studying. So does anyone has an idea about iron mill and tripod? I think uh, Thomas, uh, uh, Thomas, you have worked into it, right? Uh, into... No, I don't know too much about uh, tripod specifically. I mean, I've done like metal polishing before. I don't really know the difference though. Okay. And anyone else has heard about these techniques because you would be using them. A lot of uh, uh, students, they don't use spoken iron beam versus they use electro polishing. Any idea why? No fib damage in electro polishing. Very good, very well said. So uh, focused iron beam, uh, as you saw, I showed you um, one slide in which we had a lot of dislocation loops. Basically that image is taken into a very good condition. In, in a lot of condition, you will have a superimposition of very, very small dot kind of a feature, which is the damage which is created by the gall gallium ion beam. 
and uh, in another cases uh, uh, like electro polishing and your uh, iron mill you don't see that kind of um, effect it's very simple it's very clean you just use you know chemical to make your sample thin it doesn't leave any uh, any damage now how do we do that in jayam as well as in uh, uh, in your surf you have access to all these chemicals now one thing i would emphasize here is safety uh, all these acids are explosive uh, we use perchloric acid and ethanol very commonly uh, i think all the students who are working with iron alloys uh, in zinkels group they are using perchloric acid uh, we either uh, use ethanol with it or methanol with it and uh, it is a very good agent um, as you see here we can prepare excellent quality of aluminum and stainless steel sample because our um, speciality concerns a lot working on the reactor pressure vessel steel so this method is a top one method for all of us um, and we know the exact concentrations in the lab and we have the right equipment and we can use them to get a very good quality sample other thing we use is nitric acid and ethanol uh, the only uh, thing is that it's also very explosive so you have to keep uh, you know you have to take care that you keep it cold and dispose it off very quickly uh, do not uh, be in touch with it other kind of um, acids that we use is are hydrofluoric acid and organic solvents so hydrofluoric acid uh, generally people do not use in our labs but anyone who is making a silicon sample it uses hydrofluoric acid extremely dangerous can eat bones immediate absorption can lead to heart attack so this acid if it is used uh, i know in msc people they do a lot of study on semiconductors and they use these acid very very uh, commonly uh, and uh, i you are lucky that most of you would be working with perchloric acid not with hydrofluoric acid because i don't think so uh in, in nuclear materials we have such great application of silicon uh, until and unless we are preparing some sensors now for other organic solvents uh, that we used are acetone and trichloroethane and i am mentioning this because this is an important uh, part of your uh, tem training to know how to play with these acids carefully now coming to the point that i think rayan asked me why do we do not see kikuchi lines in some patterns the kind of experiments you want to perform for that particular experiment there are some recommended uh, thickness that you have to use here you see the values of armstrong here armstrong would mean 10 nanometer here in high resolution microscopy so i would come in the in the following slides about something about the multiple diffractions happening and how with thickness you can control those multiple diffractions and multiple scatterings and basically when you control that you you can uh, literally play with uh, different uh, experiments for example if you want kikuchi lines you want multiple diffractions and multiple scattering happening and for that you need to have a thicker sample so here you see 300 and 500 nanometer is the thickness of the sample which is required for your diffraction work and all of the g dot b analysis that people would be doing they would be keeping their sample up to this much thick now your your sample is literally in the range of becoming opaque to the electron beam so you have to be very careful to be really touching 250 nanometer not going to this limit 
because then it would be very tough. Uh, you would see a lot of dark areas, a lot of kikuchi lines, a very poor quality of diffraction pattern. So you have to be near to 50 nanometer or 300 nanometer. I never went above it. For me, it's a very thick block of sample. And uh, you would just see a dark uh, sample. For the people, uh, I think in the group, uh, you will have uh, Merve and uh, Sydney. They are doing yields. And for yeah. them, yeah, and for them, the recommendation would be to go from 10 nanometer to 50 nanometer. If thicker, there would be multiple scattering events happening. And you would not have a clear signal from eels. And all the all the your uh, absorptions and fluorescence, uh, all the spectrum, they would be difficult to interpret. So you cannot be thick when you do this kind of measurements. For high resolution uh, electron microscopy, which I think is out of the scope of this uh, class, because um, even uh, this needs a little bit higher magnification and needs at least few months of experience working with your normal microscopy. And for that, we need the thinnest sample because we are really operating at a very, very high magnification of uh, your uh, images. We are going up to a million. Uh, up to a million uh, times your your magnification. So now, how do we do uh, your electropolishing? I think I can begin with this. We are already on time uh, because this is uh, everything is new. I think I can continue on Friday, next Friday. We can continue with this and um, Julie and Tommy, please be in touch to have some sessions with me. I would not be available on Wednesday, but rest all other days I'm available, either online or either in office. Um, will you be available on Monday, Tarada? Yeah, yeah, I'm available on Monday. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so give me a heads up um, and uh, yeah. Uh, see you next Friday. Thank you guys, bye. 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 Good weekend. Bye. Bye.